touch back on this book. This is a book that we reviewed almost seven years ago. Uh, and I think it overlaps and complements so much of what we talk about in communication and gives a fresh perspective. It's one of my top 15 books that I ask parents to read. I think a lot of the books on communication that, that I read or were, were suggested to me early in my, my career, I think they were so, um, they just didn't speak to the important dynamics, the important psychology beneath the communication. And there was an implication in those early training books, those early training manuals, that if you do it this way, that everything will work out perfect, that your child will listen to you, that there'll be intimacy in, in, in a couple. And I think this book speaks to the psychology of communication better than those kinds of books. Let's get right into it. This is a, a review of Nonviolent Communication, A Language of Life by Marshall Rosenberg. Um, I have a lot of parents that will say to me, um, I wish I had this before I had kids. I wish I'd, I'd been trained this. There's a quote in, in, the, in the preface to, to this book written by Gandhi's grandson. It says, if, I, if, I, if only I had been older, a bit wiser, and a bit more thoughtful, I could have learned so much more. I, I think, first of all, it's never too late. You're not too old and it's never too late. But I think we don't learn things this way. I think we don't learn things by reading a manual ahead of time a lot of the time, right? It's, it's in vivo. It's, it's only when it becomes relevant to us. It's, we don't even know that we need this. We, we imagine when we are young that we, if we love our children, and most all parents have a fantastic amount of affection for the children, that everything will work out right, that we'll use common sense, that we'll try not to repeat the mistakes of our past, and then our ch children grow up and they start to expose us, right, to us. And we start to learn about ourselves. And then we, ha we have a hunger because our child is struggling or suffering or, or just challenged in life. We have a hunger to work on that. So then we go places to talk to people to find out how to do it differently. And I think that's, that's the learning. I think the regret of it, the regret that a lot of people express, I, I think it, it can be a momentary thing that can get you started. But if we stay in that regret, we miss the opportunity to see the process, to see the wisdom, to see how we've been prepared for this, and, and also, I think, to embrace what we need right now and going forward. Gandhi said, be the change you wish to see in the world. That's a very famous quote of his. And it's this idea that more than anything, this communication model that this book teaches us to embrace our own work. Right? If I could say in one sentence what's the summary of this book, it is to learn to communicate what you need and how you feel, and not to focus on what other people need to do. And I think that's, that quote speaks to us. Um, and then lastly, this idea of serenity. This idea that when we come from a place of, of fear and control, that we can almost never get it right. And so our project as parents, and it's probably more important with the parents that I'm talking to today or, or on these broadcasts than, than other parents, who don't have struggling children, the most important project is to work on your serenity. I told the story just the other day that somebody said to me after doing a nice piece of work how hopeful they felt. And it dawned on me when they said that. The hope comes from doing your work. The hope does not come or is not sustained by the changes in others. So hope is a product of work, right? Because if you focus on what you can control, you let go of what you can't control, and you practice remembering the difference, you're going to be more hopeful, optimistic, and free. If you focus on what you cannot control, if you make that your project, you'll experience a lot more anxiety, a lot more depression. Uh, how we think about self and others and, and don't have to be engaged in nonviolent communication or even motivated to respond compassionately, right? Well, this is a book about compassion. This is a book about how we think about ourselves and others. And, and again, it speaks to, that's why the I feel statement, I think we're at risk sometimes in our program and in, in a lot of programs to say that the I feel statement will fix things. It's a tool. And I've used the example of a crowbar or a hammer, which can be used as a tool. It could also be used for destruction. It can be weaponized. So if we don't understand what's going on, if we don't understand the psychology of it, if we don't allow the communication model to teach us that, then we really don't get at the heart of it. And we really haven't done anything but replace bad abuse with good abuse, to quote Jamie Gill in her book, Seeing. And, and we, we know that good abuse 
can't help. Um, there's this book asks us to shift our attention. Um, it, it asks us to change the way that we express and we hear other people. It, it takes us out of habitual and automatic responses, right? We all can relate to that same old discussion, that same old fight we have with our partners or our children. Why do we get stuck in that? And people will even complain to me about how contrived communication training is, that it feels foreign. And my response is good. That, that, that's a good thing to slow it down, to, to not just have the knee-jerk response, to not just have that automatic response. That, that's a good thing. That means that you're, you're building new pathways in your brain. You're building a new way of thinking. You're developing response flexibility. So it's okay when some of these things feel foreign. That doesn't mean that you trust things blindly, but that you allow for some of these things. That's what we mean by, by trust the process. And I think, again, people misunderstand trust the process to just be shut your mouth and listen to what we're saying and it'll work trust me you can express your frustration your, your difficulty your discomfort with new ideas and concepts ask for that and the invitation becomes try this for a little while pay attention to it be mindful with this new tool or skill or this way of thinking and so much of what we talk about so much of what i teach is this idea that we're changing a sensibility a way of being in the world and that's what this book, book speaks to well. I think it's a great book. Focus on what we're perceiving, feeling, and wanting. I call the I feel statement or feelings communication, uh, communication about feelings, I call it mindful talking. I mean, I think that's what therapy is. It's a mindful talking. I think we think of mindfulness always as not talking, right? There's mindful eating. There's mindful walking. There's mindful breathing. Even mindful feeling, paying attention to your body. But talking about your feelings and thoughts, talking about your perceptions, talking about what you want, your needs, is kind of a mindfulness in and of itself. That's what therapy is. There's a great book by Thich Nhat Hanh on psychotherapy and mindfulness where he makes this po point. A great Buddhist teacher, great Buddhist master. That there's so much that is, is an overlap between the practice of mindfulness and therapy and talking about what's going on for us. And some of us feel so much guilt to talk about ourselves. I have clients that will actually say to me in session, I'm talking too much about myself. I mean, you can hear that, right? You can hear that message and how it, it, it's fundamentally off. And some of what Rosenberg talks about in this book is this idea, we're going to have to let go of some of the social constructs that we've digested without processing. We're going to have to let go of those because they, they, were, they were put in place to make it easier, make it smoother, really for control. And then we, we take off the, the guardrails, right? And it's frightening. And we're afraid we can go over the side and, and fall down. There's a, there's a riskiness to it. But it's really, this, this work, in a way, is really about moral development. The kind of sensibility that we're always talking about is a higher level of morality than what we were taught, what society teaches. It's about authenticity and about being real, connection. It's about paying attention and honoring feelings. Focus us on empathy for the self and for others. Right? That, that's the, the compassion is critical. I was writing an article or, or some responses to an article in psychology today about questions about compassion and, and why is it important in relationships. And it's, it's, it's the most important thing. It's the, it's the most important ingredient in a healing and safe context. Right? And that's why we are all challenged with it at times, because when we are hurt, sad, or scared, it's very hard to hold on to compassion for, for others, sometimes even for ourselves. And, and of course, this is not about control, guilt, judgment, and shame. Most importantly, before I get into to some more specifics of the skill and the, and the book and what we're going to talk about today, is this idea of learning to hold your children in your mind with curiosity, patience, compassion. Learning that feelings, the land of feelings is important in and of itself. It's beyond the, the land of right and wrong doing. And so when your children are struggling and your children are struggling with addictions, with self-harm, with self-sabotage, with angry, aggressive behaviors, sexual acting out, video game addiction, learning differences, all those things, 
your children are struggling with all those things and that makes it more challenging to hold on to them but that's what they need they don't need a fix from you they don't need to carry around your anxiety for their disorder or their struggles they don't need you to be right they don't need your lectures they need most importantly is for you to learn how to be with them and I know that doesn't feel like enough I know it doesn't feel safe and, and protected in terms of outcomes but it's the thing that we know the most it's it's magic actually in the long run send and receiving grounded in a nat receiving grounded in a natural state of compassion right so in both positions, the sender and the receiver, it's important that we be grounded in compassion. Um, we talk about our observations. And, and, and Rosenberg, I talk about it in terms of ownership a lot. Rosenberg talks about it as, as stimulus versus cause. Not you made me feel hurt, but, but he's describing this is what happened. That was the stimulus. It didn't cause it. And there's an important distinction. It's subtle, but it's important to distinguish between when you walked out of the room in the middle of our conversation, I was hurt. That's the stimulus. That's the trigger. I was triggered by that. That's what I did with that. Of course, talk versus saying you made me do it. Or, or even saying, I think some people, some educators make the mistake of going too far and saying, I chose to feel this way. And, and I don't think that that's realistic, right? We're not choosing to feel scared. I think we could, it would be fair to say that if we don't do our work, in a way, we're choosing to feel what we feel. If we know that there's work, we know that there's trauma, we know there's anxiety, and we don't do our work, it would be fair to say about us that we're choosing to stay in that pattern, choosing to stay stuck with that feeling. But not on a day-to-day -day basis it doesn't work. So he talks about it in terms of stimulus versus cause. How we feel, talking, talking about our feelings and where they come from, right? That's why the letter of accountability for me that we ask our clients and students to write, it sometimes sounds like an excuse letter, a justification letter to parents. But, but I say it's, it's a letter of explanation. Like this is what was going on for me. This is what my feelings were. This is where they came from. And this is how I dealt with them. And there's an accountability, a responsibility in that. There's an invitation in that, actually, to do some work or to find a way to tolerate or deal with feelings in a different way. And then he talks about, we talk about in our communication model, what I hope for the future, what, what I want. He talks about it in terms of needs. I think it's a, it's a really powerful way. Uh, that, and it goes to kind of something I've been saying lately about talk about this is what I need to feel okay in this situation, in this relationship, in this contract, in this house. And, and, and it's about me, right? It's my selfish, self-centered need. And I, I use those words to actually not suggest that they're that, but to just accept that. Because that's one of the social constructs that he asks us to abandon. We've got to abandon this idea that to take care of self, to talk about your own needs, to talk about the I, is selfish. I was just talking to a client this week. What becomes more selfish is when we don't honor that, the I, and then we, in a subversive way, in a, in a covert way, we get our needs met through others. That's the selfishness, if anything. So we talk about our needs, talk about our values our desires that, that lead to certain feelings. And we make specific requests. And, and it's important, before I go on to the next page, the next slide, it's important to say, it doesn't necessarily mean that anybody will change, but you're getting clear. You're taking ownership and responsibility for yourself in this. And you're getting as clear as you can with the other. His structure, similar to ours, but has some differences. He talks about I feel and when because I need. Talks about it that way. He talks about needs instead of hopes or requests. And he ties the feelings that he's having with these needs. So I have a need to feel safe. I have a need to feel um, uh, cared about, loved. So this is where the feeling is coming from. If we express our needs, we have a better chance of getting them met. I was talking to a parent this week about this idea about uh, they were considering not discussing a certain want or request or need with a child. Because they thought, 
it was more manipulative. And I always said an, un an unexpressed desire almost always gets expressed in a more manipulative way than an overt one, a very clear one. Express yourself in, in terms of needs instead of criticisms, right? It's not you're a jerk, you're yelling, you've got an anger problem, you have this issue or that issue. But it is, this is what I need in the relationship to feel okay. Then it's not about them. And, and we know this, similar to our communication model. When we talk in this way, we're not criticizing the other person. They're less likely to be defensive. And when we say it this way, this, this clear way and this assertive way, and if there's a, a poor reaction, a defensive reaction, we're, we're in a better grounded place to take it. The, the example, that's what idiot parenting is about. That's when I say, you know, about cleanliness in my house with my children, I'll say I have OCD. I say those things to exaggerate the worst possible criticism. And, and I'm not making them wrong. I'm, I'm actually kind of being willing to be wrong myself. And when I'm willing to be wrong myself, it, it's a much safer place to be. Like I said, we have to fight the cultural training that having needs and expressing the I is selfish. That was a word, a phrase that was used by others to try to control or change our behavior that they thought was inappropriate, out of balance, but was really about their lack of capacity to hold us with compassion. Right? I, I don't think I've ever, in a good place, when I've been in a good place, I would never call a client selfish. I would never use that word. I would definitely never use that word with my children. It wouldn't even occur to me to use that word. I would find out what was ideally what's going what's going wrong with like what's what's happening. You're not okay. Why are you scared? Why were you so neglectful of the other person's needs in this situation? Why were you such a priority? Why did you do it that way? Right? That's how we would talk about it. And like I've said, I've never had, when a client asks me what's in this for me, I've had staff and therapists over the past two decades give them a lecture or, or, or suggest you, it's not what's for, in it for you. And my thought is, that's the most important question, what's in it for you, right? I, I want you to have joy and meaning and depth and authentic relationships and intimacy. That's all the rewards of all of this. So what's in it for you is important. Right, but but there's a, such a cultural message like what's in it for me is a selfish thing. No, the reason that people get sober is the same reason that they start using in the first place to feel better. The reason people get into therapy and do work and make changes is to feel better. That's what's in it for you to feel better, and that's an important and very valid question. But 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 we can think about our response and our attitude toward our children. Right? And how we try to shame them or make them smaller, make their needs smaller, or, or even to ignore. We actually sometimes suggest with this kind of language to ignore their needs. Avoid comparing when you're communicating. We do this where we compare the person to an ideal or to others. Other people don't do it this way. Right? It's a way of kind of recruiting. Avoid blaming, enhance ownership. Talk about I feel, I need, my perception. Avoid demanding, punishing when our requests are not met. D don't be confused by this. You're allowed to have boundaries in your life with everybody. You're allowed to have limits with your children, with your spouse, with your friends, with, with whomever. But it's when we're using, using the threat in a coercive way. There's a difference between saying, if you don't do this, I'm going to do this to you. And you can do what you want. Here's my limit and here's my consequence. I'm letting go of what you're going to do and I'm focusing on how I'm going to respond to it. That's different. And it's so subtle, but you can feel the energy. Uh, you know, I've, I've been more aware of how I've threatened my children to manage them. And then there's times when I've done it well, but I, I'm aware that I've threatened them with, with consequences to try to get them to do something instead of just giving them the choice, letting go of it emotionally, detaching myself from the outcome, and setting up my boundary. Separate stimulus from cause. You know, ideally, we never use the phrase, you made me feel, right? That's the simplest way. This made me feel. 
we sometimes we don't even go there. We just describe what a jerk the other person is, how cruel or mean or pick your negative characteristic and implied in it, this isn't about me and my feelings. Right? In the Letters of Juliet book and in webinar, she didn't she wasn't aware that she had an anger problem. She denied it. She just thought that the world was unfair, tilted slightly out of balance in an unfair way. Right? We we it's important to take responsibility for our anger, for our feelings. We are dangerous when we are not conscious of our responsibility to how we behave, think, and feel. As parents, as much as children. And by the way, we, we model this for children. When we tell our children, you make me feel. When we tell our children, you're responsible for my distress, my discomfort, my anger, my frustration. And, and even my reactions. When we tell our children that, we model for them that they can blame us for how they feel and blame others for how they feel. When we respond defensively to, to what they say about how they feel about us, we are reinforcing this idea that it's about us. And we're doing this unconscious way because we're saying it's not about us. But if you have a nose and it's obvious to you, you don't have to try to convince anybody. I, I never have to tell anybody. I never make the point in my life to somebody and say, I have a nose, right? I've never had that conversation because it's, I have no doubt about it. I have no question of it. Avoid demands and judgments. Avoid judgments. Um, that, that's pretty straightforward. Avoid labels, analyses, and diagnoses. I think we do a lot of that. Again, to, to weight it emotionally, to recruit expert opinions, to, to suggest to the other person the, the moral imperative, the, 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 the imperative on them it is to change. Avoid guilting, obligation, duty, and shoulds. I think a lot of us can relate to how shoulds have handicapped us in our life. Right? I, you know, again, ideally, ideally, the word should almost never comes out of our mouth when it comes to somebody else's behavior. We, we learn to replace it with things like, in my experience, for me, this is how it's worked. Or this is something I've found. It may not work for you, but for me it has. The model asks for vulnerability, right? That's, that's the opposite. Blame, I always talk about, it's really easy to talk about how my wife is being a jerk in a certain kind of way. That's easy to do. It's a lot harder to say, I feel this way. And I can even feel it sometimes when I'm doing the you statement thing and I'm making it about her and she'll say, talk about how you're feeling. Talk about what's going on for you. And I don't want to do it. I don't want it to be about me. I want it to be about her. It's a lot less vulnerable. It asks us to separate stimulus and cause. I already said that. It asks for specifically what you need and not what you don't need. I listed the imperatives that we talk about. I, I, I hope that you'll try this for some time. I hope that you'll try this in your relationships. E eradicate these phrases, these words from your language. Let's see how it works. Have to, must, should, need to, go, got to, made me, makes me, ought to. Just try the same instructions we give you in the impact letter. That's what he's talking about. They're really important. This stuff is really important, folks. The symptoms that our child's, that our children are, are, are demonstrating, are showing, are symptoms of a systemic issue, of a dance, of a, of a bigger picture. Something is broken. Something needs addressing, both in them and in the system. And when we can do our part to make our changes, that has ripple effects, that has a certain kind of energy that contributes to the healing of the family, not inadvertently reinforcing things that we don't want to see continue. Express your vulnerability. He talks a lot about this. That's a big theme of his book. Become adept at identifying and expressing a variety of emotions. Expand your emotions, especially getting past and over anger and frustration. Those are the least vulnerable ones to feel. I always say with clients, that's the door. With the, that if that's the only door that we have, then we'll walk through that one to get into it, right? We'll get into it using that. That's okay. I, especially when somebody's initial and early in therapy talking about anger and frustration, I'll spend a lot of time holding that. But, but as we continue to progress in our work together, I'll talk about this idea like what's beneath that? What's underneath that? Can you identify the primary emotion 
because anger and frustration, feelings in the family of anger are always covering up something more primary like hurt or sadness or embarrassment or fear. And he makes the point very clearly. We talk about this in our model. If the third word out of your mouth when you say I feel is like that or, or good or bad, you're not expressing a feeling. You're expressing a thought. You're not going to that vulnerable ownership place. Avoid using words that express what we think or how we see ourselves others, uh, treated, excuse me, how we see others tre treated, uh, treat us. So it's not, I feel misunderstood. I feel abandoned. I feel disrespected. I feel distrusted, unsupported, neglected, attacked. Those are all just veiled ways of saying, you're an attacker. You don't get me. You don't value me. Talk about primary feelings, sad, scared, hurt, embarrassed, anxious, worried, happy, joyful, comfort. I feel uh, serene, peaceful. Talk about feelings instead of descriptions of how people treat us. Observe without evaluating or interpreting. We talk about that in our model, right? NBC does not mandate that we remain completely objective and refrain from evaluating. It only requires that we maintain a separation between our observations and our evaluations. So when you slam the door, my interpretation is you don't like me. You're leaving me. It's not important, he explains, that we not have that second part in there, but that we own it and we separate it out from, you know, just because you, you might have walked out of the door because you were scared. You might have walked out of the door and in the middle of our conversation because you were about to blow up and you didn't want to do that. There's a limitless number of reasons why you walked out of the door. So walking out of the door is the objective piece. My evaluation of that behavior is separate. That's really, really important. It's really important that we understand our evaluations, that we be responsible for them, and that we look at where they may have come from in our background, in our childhood, how anger was treated, how conflict was treated, how mistakes were treated, so on and so forth. Um, he says we talked about four options in receiving, blaming ourselves, blaming others, sense our own needs and feelings, sense others' needs and feelings, right? It's that, that shift away from the blame, trying to control other, and the shift into recognizing and acknowledging one's own, own needs and others' needs. He describes in this model stages of change that we go through in the uh, nonviolent communication model. First, there's this kind of emotional slavery, just soaked in, in guilt and, and blame. We see ourselves as responsible for other people's feelings, right? Second stage is the obnoxious stage, where we feel angry. We are no longer want to be responsible for other people's feelings. This is kind of the early stage of therapy when I see it for children and parents, right? They feel empowered, angry at others, ready to defend themselves against these threats, this blame, that this this emotional slavery. And then the third stage is emotional liberation. We take responsibility for our intentions and actions. And, and it's probably more accurate to say for most of us that we, that we oscillate between all three of these at times and that we try to make it our practice to be in the third stage, but that we can recognize when we go back to stage one or two. I, I'll, I'll quote again Jamie Gill from her book Seeing. When she's talking about it, in terms of a therapist, but let's let's substitute the word for therapist that she uses. Let's substitute the word parent. She says, and I'm going to make that substitution. She says, it's not important, it's not imperative that every parent is the paragon of health. In fact, no one is. But what is important is that a parent understand the ideal and understands how far away from that ideal they are positioned. Right? That's what, what's important. That's what my work is as a father, as a, as a husband. And when I can do that, I can own it, I can be responsible. I, I, I'm working on the right project then, which is me. Learning to embrace your own inner crazy, your own childhood, your own wounds. Learning how they affect you. That's the important work. So let's go to the take home. He talks about some core principles of taking ownership, being responsible for ourselves, 
that we use the communication to, to develop awareness and, and out of awareness becomes a greater choice, greater liberation, greater freedom. We also learn to move through our emotions when we honor them and, and feel them. Right? We can stay stuck if it's about somebody else changing. He contrasts that with blame. That's the emotional slavery piece. With the lack of differentiation between others, right? You make me feel something does not differentiate between us. It's cause and effect and between self. Understanding the difference, for example, that he makes between understanding an event and our interpretation or evaluation of that event. He changes it from an other focus to a self-focus and he changes the model for communication. I don't use communication to get somebody to change. I use it to invite them to ask for something, but I don't use it in a coercive way to try to get somebody to meet my needs. I take responsible for those myself. Out of that comes intimacy. And intimacy is not effortless. Intimacy is not comfortable, right? I think we think of intimacy as warmth and fuzzy and loving. Intimacy is two people showing up authentically. And that might mean that there is going to be hurt, anger, sadness, frustration, disappointment, fear. Can you be present with an other's otherness? That's going to be uncomfortable. You're going to have to do some work. You're going to have to know yourself well enough. You're going to have to feel comfortable with yourself enough to, to be there for them. Versus needing them to feel, think something different. And that's hard. That's what connects us to each other. But it takes capacity. It doesn't just come out of love. Most people in our culture, in the cultures that I work with, which are North America and in some other parts of the world, most people do not have a, an awareness of how much capacity that takes. And, and make that their project to expand, get larger, and transform. And I think, essentially, that's what our children and, and their behavior, their symptoms, their diagnosis, I think that's what the, it's asking of us. It's asking us to develop more and more and more capacity. And I'm so grateful to be a therapist for these past 20-some years. I'm so grateful for what all of this work has taught me about capacity, about my family, about working with your children and you, is that I get to learn that I can be happy, happier, and, and, and actually allow people to show up in my life in all of those different areas, <clears throat> how they are, without me needing to change them. And, and my experience has, has shown me, has, has been, that when I can do that, I'm more helpful. I'm more supportive to help others get to where they need to go than... than when I thought it, my job was to come in and fix and manipulate and, 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 and do this other thing. So I'm very grateful for it. Happy to take any questions. Our son is in a residential treatment program where we visit him locally. The plan for him is to be discharged to a sober living. The staff seem, seems to be delaying in his discharge by avoiding the questions we have about where he may go. This is getting me uncomfortable. I do not want to just rely on the staff to know when he is ready. How do we see when our son is ready to leave and move on? What do we look for in our son, and how do we ask him about this as we, have, as we communicate with him? We don't want to push him to leave too early, but... You know, I think essentially the best way to say that is... That's a tough question. It's not easy. But... but what I'm hoping is, first of all, I'm kind of stuttering. It's a good question. Ask it of the staff. Ask it of your son and try to listen. But in the conversation, right, in the conversation where you're listening to people, well, here's my suggestion. Don't decide in that conversation. Take all of that information into your head. Take it back if you have a co-parenting partner and run it through a filter. If you have, a, if you have your own therapist, Talk with him or her about that, right? But it's important that you not take it at face value, but that you learn to, to, to develop the ability to listen. This may be your son asking. <coughs> it may be your son asking through the treatment professionals, I'm not ready yet. I need more. 
of a foundation. I need more of a plan. I need more structure. I need more support. It may be that. Right? Or it may be about the staff and their beliefs. And so that's, that's my thought about it. You can also invite and ask. I've had this happen on my end before. If you have a home therapist that you trust that you're working with, have that home therapist join the call or, or, or a call with the therapist where you ask these questions. And, and I've had that happen hundreds of times where home therapists, other therapists have joined the phone call. And, and I can talk with them and to you about that. And they can help you to understand what you may or may not be hearing, right? So those are a few thoughts. Is there a list of these words for references? Yes, there's a, there's a list of the, if you have the impact letter instructions. I also talk about it in my book uh, when I talk about imperatives. Um, but, but in, so those are the two places that I would give to you. You can also read uh, Nonviolent Communication because he talks about it. He doesn't list, give it in a list form like I do, but he talks about what things to avoid. When you spoke about holding our children with compassion, being with them, can you please expand or add when the child is in active using? My need is to find the balance between with assertiveness, and I struggle with this as a parent. I want to give you a reference, and I've, I think I've given this before, but if you haven't yet, watch the, the TED Talk on addiction and connection. And just Google addiction and connection and, and, and rat park, R-A-T, like a rat. Rat Park. And there's a 15-minute TED Talk about a researcher who had a lot of addiction in his family. And he learned that the opposite of addiction was connection. And so some of the things we think about in terms of addiction and struggle, we think about cutting off and, and, and not talking and behavioral punishments. And he talks about how Portugal changed. the, the They were the first country to legalize essentially all drugs. And they change it from a criminal issue to a connection issue. And they, they, they develop programs. He talks about it. But it's the right question. And, and, and you learn in therapy how to do that. You learn that you can be present with somebody who's using. You know, if somebody's high, there's probably not a lot of value in it. But I, I, I've demonstrated role plays, for example, where you can sit down at lunch with your young adult child who's using and talk about how you love them. Talk about how you want to be there with them. And there's certain ways and certain things you can't do for them, but you want to be in their life and, and you care about them. So it's a challenge. If they're actively high in using, there's probably not a lot of value. But, but if we come at it from anger and blame and judgment and disgust and frustration, we're not very valuable to them. If So that's why they spend so much time talking about um, the disease of addiction because or, or the the disease the brain diseases of bipolar or, or whatever whatever it is that they're struggling with because when we see that it's a disease we we have more compassion because yes there's choices in everything but you don't get to choose to be born with the addiction gene you don't get to choose to be born with a predisposition to bipolar there is work responsibility out of that but we have more compassion when we realize it's not all simply about conscious choice. And we can learn to hold them. I'm more capable today of holding my clients and my children than I was 20 years ago because of my work and my understanding. And my belief that you don't control by simply withdrawing love or affection. I'm going to have my visit with my son in the next couple of weeks. Can I ask the therapist to prepare a report when I'm there about what he sees with our interactions? They ask us to write a letter about our visit, but I'm curious about what they view. I think that would be great. Say that, express it as your need. Like that would be helpful for me to 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 learn to see the world through my son's eyes. I want. I would like to request that for me. You know the funny thing about that. Now I'll just make a, a quick aside about that. the The problem is, is that many people will say. Um, you need to do this because it will be good for you. And, and as parents, we, we, we don't know. We don't, how to, we don't know how to say, this is my need. This is what I need for me. This is my request of you. Can you do this? Are you willing to do this? 
somebody asked what the name of my book was. It's The Journey of the Heroic Parent. Later, when I go past this slide, you'll see a picture of it and, and a place to get it. The Journey of the Heroic Parent. You can get it on Amazon or BarnesandNoble.com or in bookstores. Many of the parents I have interviewed stated that their children went back to smoking pot after the program and that they just learned about giving in for some things. Your thoughts. I am hopeful this does not happen and how I can prevent it. You can't prevent it. You can't. You can only do your work. This, I, I, you know, we, we do as much as we can to help them, and our outcomes are fantastic. The research is fantastic, and you're going to hear the other stories for sure because they exist. Even though our outcomes are fantastic and, and exceed the, the industry standard, there's a percentage of them that, that go back and relapse. But doing your work, is all you can do. I, I, I'll say that simply. You cannot prevent your children from making different choices. And knowing that, you will be different with them. Knowing that, you'll have a different focus. You'll stop focusing on trying to change their behavior and trying to, you'll focus on trying to change yours. If you were to attend, for example, Al-Anon or Families Anonymous or Codependence Anonymous, th those are organizations that are created for people whose loved ones are, are addicts, alcoholics, and, and self-sabotaging in other ways besides substance abuse. But if you realize, if you go there, what you'll realize, what you'll be told over and over and over again is focus on what you can control. Let go, learn to detach from what you can't control and the wisdom to know the difference. And let me tell you the irony of that. Embracing that concept actually makes you more impactful and powerful. In, in my book, I talk about the difference between control versus influence. There's a chapter on that. And I teach my therapist what I'm teaching you guys all the time. And they say, but Brad, we're hired to help facilitate change. And I say, I know this is how you do it. What I'm teaching you is how you do it. I have become more impactful the less I've tried to aim and control things with my clients than I was when I was younger. When I thought it was my job to aim and control things. So do your work, do your work, do your work. Change your focus. Change the question. And you will make a greater contribution. But they have three C's in al -Anon. You didn't cause it. You can't control it. And you can't cure it. Right? You cannot. That's not your job. Your job is to show up in life more authentically, more honestly, more assertively, more compassionately, more aware. I could, I could go on. That's, those are things that are your job. And learning to let go and give your child their job is their job. And even if they relapse, being there for them in the best way possible to support them in the best way possible so that you don't get in the way of that, right? You don't become a part of the relapse yourself. I'm afraid to go to one of those meetings. How do we enter? Um, I love that question. Um, you enter vulnerably and you enter scared. I, I, I love that question. And I've said this before on the webinars. Um, I've said to my, my clients, my, my, the parents that I work with, if nothing else, and I believe in these meetings, I believe in these organizations, but if nothing else, you will know how it feels for your child to walk into the group at a vote. And if nothing else, you'll have more empathy for what you're asking him or her to do. There's a slide later on in, in where we have the, the websites that you can go to. Let's see if I can find them here. Um, this is the slide. Go to alanon.org, coda.org, familiesanonymous.org, naranon.org. For teenagers, it's alateen.org. You can also go to NAMI. They have classes and support and resources there too, nami.org. But find a meeting, find a time, walk in. They're welcoming of newcomers. They, they, that's what they call you, newcomers. They'll ask you to raise your hand if you're a newcomer. And they absolutely know how to support you and reach out to you. They'll have people raise their hands if you have questions. They'll have people offer to give you their phone numbers if you want them, to call them and ask them questions. You can walk up to people and say, are there any other meetings that you like? I don't know what to do. Show up. I, I love it because you just show up not knowing. I mean, what a great gift to give to your child to walk into uh, a frightening place. 
and I've had people get mad at me for saying this. I've had people resist it. Some people have gone and said I, they don't get it. But I've had so many people say, in fact, there's people on this webinar that I'm looking at right now because I can see your names who have told me this, that at first it wasn't something they wanted to do, and now it changes their life, and they're richer for it, far richer for it. So thank you for asking. Thank you for being real and honest. Give that gift to your child. Show up not knowing. Show up scared. And then get support. We ask you to go to six of these at least. That's, that's the general kind of idea, standard. Go to six. Give it a try. See what it feels like. And learn to hear the similarities. They might be talking about an alcoholic spouse, but there's a core principle in there if you have a depressed daughter. Learning how to be in relationship to other people. Thank you for that courageous question. By the way, that is the heroic journey. The heroic journey is to walk into, in myths and stories, they talk about walking into the forest or going down into a cave, going to some frightening land, faraway land. The metaphor, the symbol of that in myth and in storytelling is to walk into something that is scary, to walk into a room that is scary, a session that is scary, a meeting that is scary. All right. I thank you today. Thank you for your questions and your participation. Uh, really an honor to be here. Follow us on social media just for announcements. We have inspirational things also. Um, and, and our blog is listed there too. I just, I just published a blog, blog, took it off of my personal website, put it on the Evoke site. So some of you may have read it, but it's about how parental limitations impact children. We invite you to read that, look at that. Uh, but you can go to our blog and look at all of our team's blog. You can go to the Second Nature Alumni Foundation on, book, on Facebook. That's for people who can't afford therapy. It's a charity organization uh, founded by alumni parents. Uh, you can search our, our page on Facebook by searching Evoke Therapy Programs. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram for announcements and inspiration. We post on those things daily. This is the copy of my book, The Journey of the Heroic Parent. It's available on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. If you go to the Parent Alumni Foundation book page on Amazon, there, there's the URL listed there. Then they have the recommended books that our therapists have recommended to parents. And if you buy it from that page, uh, it's the same price as on the regular Amazon site, only a percentage of the proceeds goes to the charity that I mentioned earlier. I'll see those of you in New York City this Tuesday night, 6.30 to 8.30. Um, looking forward to that. Uh, and then in Los Angeles, we'll be there at the end of the month in Los Angeles our, on our usual Sunday Four to five potluck, five to seven meeting in Studio City. And then the Bay Area, we have a new location at an IOP. So you'll also have the chance to learn about an IOP and what it is because uh, they're, they're graciously allowing us to use their space. Uh, if you want to do deeper work, we have one or two spots left in the Finding You in March. So if you want to get on that, get on that. Finding You is a four-day program that I run where you go deep into your own family of origin. We do mindfulness training. You find out how your own family, your own background, your own history affects what's going on today. Also, the workshops, we want every parent who can come to a workshop to come to it while they're with us, while their child is with us. The next one is March 11th and 12th in Cascades. Email gaylatevoketherapy.com for more information on those. For the intensives, and if you want to do a, a family intensive, um, you can also email intensives at evoketherapy.com. Pursuits trips are high adventure trips for families or for young adults. Sober fun, therapy light. You can mix in some therapy, but it's a lot about the adventure and, and the fun of it too. And then I don't have a topic for this Thursday. It'll be March 2nd, 6.30 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. We'll come up with a topic and announce that to you. Send it out by Wednesday morning. All right, folks. Have a great weekend. Rest of your weekend. Rest of your Sunday. And for those of you in New York, look forward to seeing you Tuesday night. Take care, and I'll, I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.